Thank you very much. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your goodness to us. God, we just feel unworthy. And to look upon this audience today and see this birthday cake playing here, I'm sorry, Father, you forgive me. I just can't talk. But I pray, God, that somehow, somehow that this stream of divine love will help everyone. Bless these people who have done this great thing, Father. And I just ask that your blessings will be with us so great today until the whole building will be flooded with your glory. And, and think at the very time looking at that deaf and dumb people passing by, going to the other side. Oh, I pray, God, somehow do something in a great way for us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. May God's blessing rest upon Buckman. I just pray that God will bless you, my dear friend. That's the prettiest thing. I guess have you showed it to the public, have you? Isn't that beautiful? I want to take this time to thank you. There's no way in the world that I could ever repay any of you for your kind blessings. And I noticed the presence that was given to me. And then the little gifts and the envelopes and the cards and things. Marvelous. This makes me feel like I want to make an appointment to come back next year for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Connie. <laughs> Ma, that is wonderful. I looked around, I didn't know what that was, and it sure is pretty. And all your gifts, there's only one thing I can say, and this is not exactly what to say with a prayer. God bless you. And if I never be able, and God never lets me do it in this life to to show my appreciation for all these gifts from everyone. Even a little girl had a, a little envelope in there, and it was her tithings of about eight cents, I think it was. She <laughs> sent it to me for her birthday present, her tithing. From that to these great presents here, oh, God, richly repay you, my dear brothers and sisters. I just, I didn't think you... Really thought that much, I mean, really I do appreciate it. Today is is uh, we taking it for the heart to heart talk. I believe today, just instead of preaching, was just to talk and maybe explain some of the things that may seem so mysterious to you in the meetings. <clears throat> kind of out of breath, just, I uh, wasn't expecting another birthday uh, today, and just coming in the door, met my good friend here, Art Wilson, I guess the Christian businessman, all know him, your, your home is in uh, Oregon, isn't it, or Reno, Nevada, brother Art Wilson to my right, the next man is Mr. Woods, Mr. Banks Woods, it's a... Uh, my friend and neighbor, Mr. Woods, has been going with me, and many of you people know him by selling books in the meeting. The man has been a very successful contractor. And one day, while I was in Louisville, Kentucky, having a meeting, himself being a Jehovah Witness, his wife being a Methodist, they had heard of the meeting, so they just drove down to find out how true it was. And on that night, there was a girl who was petrifying, had been laying for several months, not able to even move any joint from her hips down. A young lady of about, or oh, missus, about 15 years old, got right up out of her stretcher as she brought the platform, walked all over the place. Next day, just went ahead, turned back to school in a few days. Normally, well, yet. And many things the Lord did. So Mr. Woods having something to do of house to finish or something he was on, he had to hurry and get it done. Went to Houston, Texas to my next meeting. 
There he was standing in the room that night when the angel of the Lord appeared and the uh, cameras caught the picture of the angel, and which the picture that you've seen yourself here. Then he had a, one of his great uh, alternatives. He had a crippled boy, and his leg was drawn up under him. And then, Mr. Woods, when I came back, I went overseas and over to Sweden and come back. And then they put the tent over in, um, I believe it was Cleveland, or Cleveland, Ohio. And Mr. Woods, yet, of course, in the crowd, just thought along like many of you yet today, but determined to stay until it was over. That's the way. It's the way to do it. And he uh, laid aside his work and brought the boy up to Cleveland. After a few nights that was in the meeting, of course, I don't remember, only just by the tape, he was sitting back in a tent, way back, he and his wife, and uh, the Holy Spirit came down and said, the lady sitting back there with her husband, a contractor, said she herself has a tumor and her boy is crippled, but thus saith the law, healed. Got the little fella up. He's a fine, young, straight leg from that very hour on, just as normal as any boy could be. Mr. Woods quit contracting. He's loafing with me. <laughs> so his boy and my boy are great chums together, and he's just as normal and well as any boy expecting to go in the army right away. So the Lord is good, isn't he? He's full of mercy. And how many great things that he has did in our midst. Now, today, now tonight, I think being that we're going to start a little early, I've got to be in Louisville, Kentucky by an appointment in the morning at 8 o'clock and got to drive all the way down tonight, which is around 8 or 10 hours drive. So we'll get there just about in time to get to the appointment. We'll leave right straight from here to the to Louisville and by car. And then uh, we are aiming to start the services just a little early tonight. And we appreciate your coming out just a little early, if you will. They told me I could be on the platform. The cards will be given at 6 o'clock, Brother Joseph said. And um, we were just, the Army may get Billy pretty soon, so Mr. Woods is giving out prayer cards and Billy's breaking him in. <laughs> I said, how are you getting along, Mr. Woods? He said, say. <laughs> he said, it's fine, but said, I got down to two cards and had six people wanted them. <laughs> he said, what are you doing in that case? I said, just watch you <laughs> Uh, I said, well, um, he, and last night, it, it, when he was so happy, he said to see the people that, that he had uh, give the cards to standing on the platform and the, uh, God healing them and making them well, and he was so happy about that. Now, tonight they're to be given out at six because I think I'm supposed to be on the platform at quarter of eight. I uh, believe that's right. And then so we can dismiss a little early on account of the long, tiresome drive tonight. So thank you for coming out this afternoon and on this windy, cold afternoon, and yet you come out at shows you never come out to be seen. You come out for what good you could get out of the meeting from God. And I pray that he will bless you uh, abundantly. Now, mainly, it doesn't mean that people have to be here at 6 o'clock. Just you who want prayer cards. And now, may the Lord add his blessings to all of our gathering together. And I, I hope that someday the Lord willing soon to be back in Chicago again and to serve the Lord. The Bible said here, if there be one who is spiritual or prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him and vision. May the Lord add his blessings to his word. Now, just as a heart-to-heart -heart talk, I'm going to 
Joseph don't know this, but I'm just going to ask him if he will just, any time he wants to interrupt me talking and say anything. We had an interview, something like this, this morning on the radio. Did you all hear the program? That's, and so then to, to today, I thought maybe just to kind of get the, the feeling of the people so that you can see that the operation of the supernatural and just give a heart-to-heart -heart talk to one another. Let you in on the inside of this just as far as I can go. And I've never, many of these things that I've got on my heart to say, I've never said to an audience before in my life. So may he add his blessings to what we say. <clears throat> the first thing we want to speak of is what is a vision? What would it be? Some, so many people, I'm not saying as our brother Billy Graham said, answering my critics, I'm so thankful I have so few critics. Nearly everyone, some of them who's never been to the meeting, they might say, oh, well, there's nothing to that. But once in the meeting, it pretty near always settles it when Jesus gets a hold of their heart and they see then that it's, that it's true. A vision is... Uh, is just many people uh, ask me, Brother Branham, is it the uh, material that you look at, or is it uh, just uh, uh, impressed on the mind, or what is it? No, it's material. It's just as real as I'm looking right now. And now, how that happens, it's done by the sovereign grace of God. And when just a baby, when I was first born, my mother tells me that this light come in and hung over the little bed that I was born in. And then, uh, since I can remember, those things have taken place before me. It just, it just opens up. It just seems like there's no way I could have really explained it, but just to get the best that I could, just the yielding to the Holy Spirit. And it just starts, and there it is before you. You're conscious that you're standing here, and yet you're 40 years back in somebody's life watching what they're doing. And then the only thing that I say is just what I'm looking at. And then when I kind of come to myself, I realize I've said something, but many times I don't know what I've said. And the way I get it is these boys, them sitting down here, this tape recorders, they play it back over for me, and that's how I pick it up. So it isn't in myself at all. And then that, that is given for one's, one purpose. Now, I think, and I say this from my heart, that the greatest and highest form that there is for God to get his message to his people is for the people to believe his word. That's right. That's the highest form. Preaching the gospel is the highest form. Then, if you notice, the Bible places it that way. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. And so forth. Then on down, on down, then into the nine spiritual gifts operating in every local body. Now, my services in America hasn't been too good uh, as they should have been in America. My services are more forceful for the Lord overseas. They rally to it better. Now, I don't know why. Now, I'm not speaking of you people. No, I'm speaking of the general public, see, all around. Like Chicago and Hole, we'd say, or, or Durban, South Africa and Hole, see, something like that, or Mexico City and Hole. Well, they will respond to it 80% more than they will in America. Now, what the Americans respond best to the healing services, of, of my opinion, is, well, a Brother Oral Roberts. Now, Brother Oral Roberts is a forceful speaker, a real preacher, and a good God-fearing brother, a Brother Oral Roberts, and a bosom friend of mine, a lovely bro uh, brother. And I have a great, deep respect for Brother Roberts. And the Lord is with him and blessing him tremendously. And his meetings here in America 
He, we both might go into a city, and he'd set his meeting, and I'd set my meeting. His audiences would snow mine over by many times, just with a little advertisement, because his ministry has a greater impact here in America because he's such an uh, uh, influential speaker. He's, and he's got uh, a way he's smart and educated and knows the Bible, and he can present it in such a way that the educated people listen to that because that's on the level that they're, they're living. But take us, when we went to Africa, well, there was no comparison at all, see? And the people that's uneducated, so forth, look for the supernatural because they don't have this, the education and uh, been taught scholarly like uh, these people here. So then the, um, it's a thing that the Lord has given to win the people. Now, I don't mean to say that many educated, smart, shrewd, some of the highest, even the kings, potentates, monarchs, certainly they believe it and receive it. But in the general run, our American churches, it's been a long time since we've had a revival, way right. back in the Wesley age. Right. The old generations died out when Wesley people used to be kicked out and called holy rollers and jerkers because they jerked their head and, and laid in the, uh, on the platforms and all around in the aisles. They poured water on them and fanned them when the Holy Ghost was on them. Now, that day has died out a long time ago. We've all settled down to, oh, so orthodox. <laughs> but that's the reason they can't, the people today are taught, well, uh, a speaker who can uh, present it in uh, a master way. Well, that's just all right. That's just fine and dandy. And as long as you receive Christ, that's the, that's the main thing. Just as long as you receive Christ. Now, uh, we notice our brother Roberts, you heard his program this morning perhaps, and I read the articles in the paper and got it first handed from how that, and down in Australia, what a horrible thing. I'm jeering and call him fake and everything and run him out like that. Or perhaps the, this type of ministry would have shut that thing up right now. Yeah. It would have been different. And, but Brother Robert, yet God has given him a way to work with people that I couldn't touch. And maybe I work with people that he can't touch. Right. But together we are brothers trying to do what right. we can for the kingdom of God. Right. And visions is just a part of the gospel right. that's preached. Now, you see, if I'd had an education and probably had a good voice and so forth and could have uh, presented the gospel like I'd have probably been a, a preacher of that type. But God, knowing that I wasn't going to be educated, he had to give me something else to work for, with, you see. And that's how he did it. It's the only thing that I know. Now, you might wonder what takes place on the platform when a, a, a patient, or I wouldn't say it that way, that's too much in medical term. May I say when a friend is standing before me, wanting help. Here's what takes place. Now, I have nothing to do with that. Not one thing. It's that patient itself operating that divine gift. I have nothing to do with it at all. I just keep yielding, yielding, until their spirit and the spirit that is the only that I'm yielded to, till the Holy Spirit, I will call it this, make it this way, rather, so that you'll understand. Here's the Holy Spirit up here. And then I just keep yielding myself to him till I know that he's, he's there. And I'm speaking to the person so I can get their attention until then I know nothing else. And the Holy Spirit, by my spirit being yielded, shows me their life. And when that takes place, that builds the faith of the patient up to a place like this. And many times, then I start to say something else, and it'll stop me and say, Thus saith the Lord. I watch that. That's perfect each time. It never fails. It'll tell them just what's fixing to happen. And it'll be that way. Mark it down and see if it isn't that way. 
Now, that the patience doing that. Now, I might give this just in a little amateur form so that you'd understand. Say there, there's a great big, we're all little boys and girls, and we were down at the uh, back in boyhood time, and there's just a great big fence here, and there's a carnival on the inside. And I, I, I just happen to be a little taller than you. Maybe you're stronger than I am, but I'm taller. See, God makes people different ways for different works. Well, then, way up here, just about where I can look through, there's a hole in the wall. Well, now, I can get a hole of the top because I reach a little higher and can pull up all my fingers and look through this hole. I can come back and tell you what I saw. You get the idea now? You follow me? Yeah. Now, now maybe the next man, he's stronger. But he can't see that tall. So he say, Brother Branham, what do you see? I'll say, just a moment, and I'll leap up real high and catch my fingers over the end and pull myself up real heavy. And I'll say, I, I, I see an elephant. And I come down. See? It's strange because I'm lifting up. I'm saying this like in a parable so you'll be sure to understand. Now, when I come back down, what did you see? An elephant. See? All right. Now, that's like the person standing on the platform are using the divine gift as it's a strain because the person themselves is operating that gift. They're not conscious of it, but they're operating it themselves. Now, I was told last night that there was a man standing on the platform, Brother Joseph told me after he met me, that the man was, uh, uh, first when he come up, and I thought he was deaf and dumb. I said, how did he do, sir, something on that order? I mean, I quote it back, right? I'm taking what they told me. I've never heard the tape yet. And said, the man uh, just stood there, and I said, well, maybe he's deaf and dumb. And I watched Sovereign Grace. See? That's like the maniac at the platform. That's like the witch doctor in Africa standing there with bones in his fingers to give you a challenge, you see? Grace takes a hold, man. You don't have to worry. There's not a worry about it. Grace takes a hold. God takes a hold where you can't take hold. And then when the man is standing there before, I, I said, well, perhaps he's deaf and dumb. And all of a sudden, there appeared a vision before me. Then I excuse that watch alarm, and that was to get, come over here and get started at. So um, I know you picked it up on this. Just give me a watch or <laughs> alarm. So... That isn't stopping time yet, I hope. <laughs> so, in the, um, I'll hear this, don't worry. <laughs> so then, the man standing there, the vision, uh, quickly perhaps saw Finland. Or something, I don't remember. But whatever it was, they said, I told him that he was a Finn. And he, a fool and a, something other made that he was a fin. Well, Joseph here said he could, and that was outstanding to him, how it would know what nationality the man was. God in his grace showed that. It, it, was, it was this, that you didn't say a word to the man. Yes, sir. So then you said, uh, I thought you were deaf and dumb, you said. But you said, no, you are not deaf and dumb. You just don't understand English. That was it. That was it. That was it. That was it. And I, I couldn't figure out how you could understand that. <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> and I didn't. <laughs> but then it told him that he had, uh, I believe it was uh, trouble with his liver or something. Yeah. Yeah. Heart trouble. You told, heart. Him, you told him he was finished. He was a preacher. And he had heart trouble. I wonder if it would be by chance that that man would be in the building today, and if somebody is sitting near him that would um, just kind of, if they could speak Finnish, would, would uh, see, if that's right, would you raise up your hand if the man is in the building today, the Finnish man that was here last night was we are speaking of that was on the platform. I just wanted to... Wanted I, uh, I knew the man. Oh, so, you know yeah, him? I know the man, so I know it was correct. <laughs> I thought maybe he'd come all the way from Finland just to be prayed for. Uh, he, uh, he has been here uh, 
a year or two, but uh, he was not young when he came, so he has never learned English. Oh, that, that, yeah. He has finished yeah. meetings up in Waukegan, Illinois. Well, that's, I guess he went back maybe to his home. Now, now, when Jesus was here on earth, and the, he was God's anointed mouthpiece. Do you believe that? Amen. He was the, the only begotten Son of God. And God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself without measure. Do you believe that, Bible? He was the Emmanuel. There's none of us will ever come to that place. No. No, he was God's holy, virgin-born son. And never will we be, never will we be able to do the things that, like that because he was that. But now he promised that the things that he did, we would do also because we would become adopted children to God through him. Is that right? Right. Now that's, not, that's for every one of us. Every believer becomes sons and daughters of God. Is that right? Amen. Now, when the woman with the blood issue touched his garment, that was just like peeping through the hole, see? He felt virtue went from him. He got, he got weak, but he didn't know what happened. Somebody had touched him by a, a faith, and he asked who it was, and everybody denied. So then, what taken place after he did that? Why, he looked around until he found. Now, there's, how did he know her? That's the question I want to get to. How did he know her? Now, let me try with, as a brother to explain this. How he knew her, because when anyone has done that, I can say from the meetings here, from the operation of the Holy Spirit, when anyone has been blessed, it just seems like it's just something pulling you like that. See? And you get to the person, and then just above the person, you see them. And what's happened to them, and what's wrong with them. And then you look, and you see it's the same person, and it's just like a, an avenue or a channel that's working between you and the person. That's how I think, he never explained it, that's how I think that he knew it, because the Holy Spirit working in a similar way, that's the way that's understood. Say, like, sometimes you say, the lady sitting there that's got a green hat on or something like that, you have been suffering with so-and-so, you come from a certain place, you're listening to that, see, you're right in the vision, watching what's taking place, and then maybe you see her spring back and slide around her and everything, well, then you say, why, she's healed. It's thus saith the Lord, see? The Lord who's showing the vision is just your faith in him is using me as a mouthpiece to say to you what you desire him to tell you. See what I mean? Now, but when it's the other, now that is just permissive way of God working. I say this reverently, the hour is close at hand when I, after I tell you what the vision of the Lord has showed me, that this will finally move back. Right. given place to something far beyond it. And um, that's what I want to get to this afternoon. Now, the person doing that will, will, if they'll believe it, they'll be blessed and they'll get well. Now, not if they were healed, but their faith touched God and accepted their healing that's already been appropriated for them 1,900 years ago. Right. See? It's not a, that had anything to do with their healing. It was just a mouthpiece to speak. How, any place in the Bible, we're not, I'm not comparing myself with a prophet, no, sir. No, I'm just a poor a sinner saved by grace. But the gift that the Lord gave the prophets and made them prophets, they were God's mouthpiece. Right. They had the word of the Lord. And no prophet ever did do anything just upon his own desire. He did it first after God had told him. That's right. And that's the way the Son of God, when he came, which was the God of the prophets, he said, I only do as the Father shows me to do. That's right. It only has to come through 
divine powers to reveal to flesh, and Christ was God's mouthpiece on earth. Right. Everybody understand that? Right. Now, for instance, sometimes I'll be at home. Gene, Leo, and them that I was talking about last night sitting down here. Brother Beeler, man, the rest of them, and the ones who know me. At home, I'll be walking through the house, not thinking of anything. Maybe sit down in the room, and there will come a vision. And maybe it'll sit perfectly still for quite a little while. And it'll say, you'll say, now you're going to have a call in a few moments from the phone. And you're going into this city. And when you go to this city, you'll go to a certain place. It'll be this way. And you'll go into the room and you'll lay your hat down. Or the lady will lay your hat on the bed. But it isn't supposed to lay there. It's supposed to be laying over on the table. And another lady will come in this way. You'll see it all acted out just exactly the way it's supposed to be done. And if I fail in one of those things, it won't happen. It has to be just exactly to the moment and the time and everything positionally the same for its division. It, ha it has to be perfectly materialized. And then when it does, it's got to happen. It's never failed. Now, that's when God's using his gift. That doesn't weaken me. That doesn't bother me. Now, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the grave was a far more of a miracle than what the woman was that touched his garment and was healed with a blood issue. Do you admit that? Right, he never said one word about getting weak and virtue going out of him because God was using his gift. See? That's that kind of vision. That's that type of vision. But when people use the gift of God, and what makes me weak in sorts of platform, it's you yourself. That's what's they're doing it. You yourself is the doing the work, the operating. That's the reason it's pulling through. It's either you using God's gift or God using his gift. Now, in comparison, I'd say, if you ask me, what's in there? Well, it's a giraffe. What else did you see? What's uh, getting tired? See, if uh, something else you see. But now when God wants you to know what to take place, he, he just picks you up and raises you up above the whole thing and says, here's the whole circus. See? This is the whole picture. You're going to do this and do this and do this and that. Set you back down. He's got you lifted up with his everlasting arms and wings, and there's nothing in the world. You come back down, you feel like shouting the victory. <laughs> but that's it. Now most people, they think that someone who sees visions ought to be divine. No, sir. Not by no means. No, sir, there's no one divine but God. That's all. And there's no one, there's no difference in none of us. We're all sinners saved by grace. And one's not above the other. Just one's given something, and he'll have to answer for what he done with what talent was given. That's right. Every person has to answer for that. Now, I might tell you a vision that's just recently happened. And so that Brother Joseph asked me to do this so that the people that share in the building it couldn't get the, the issue of this magazine would understand it. I had made, when I first become uh, a servant of the Lord to pray for his sick children, you know the story, how he told me that I was born to pray for sick people. Now, you say, oh, I've heard that many times of well, uh, different people. That, it's all right. See, that they, I, I can't answer for someone else. I have to answer for my own. And you have to answer for yours. Now, that is true. And then when he told me that, uh, I knew that there was, in this ministry, there would have to be a lot of things under consideration. Money, for one thing. Well, I made a promise to God that I wouldn't take the people's money and I asked him, I didn't want people's money, but I knowed in that there'd be a lot of money given to me, and I'd have to refuse it. So I told him as long as he prospered my ways so I wouldn't have to beg for money, I would stay on the field as long as he prospered me. But when he got so, he failed me to where we'd have to beg or take hours or whatever they do to take up offerings, as I'd seen it many times in my own denomination church that I belonged to then, then I said, I, I would come in off the field. He blessed me for about nine years. 
But in California, it, my ministry looked like it began to drop down. Somehow, mail fell off. Looked like if people wasn't interested. Well, I thought, God, that's all in your hands. Or you used to get around a thousand letters a day or something like that, and be down there, it would drop down to 600, then 500, then down to 400, 300, 100, to 75, somewhere down to about like that a day, 75 letters a day, maybe. Well, I thought, well, I wonder what's happened. I don't know if I've done anything. If I had to, to for the people, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Of course, I thought, well, I haven't got, I don't sell things, and the only thing people write to me for is to get prayer cloths, and we don't sell them, we give them to them. So, well, Lord, maybe you're fixing to change things. And I went to California and went about, about $15,000 in debt in a meeting. And that night, when I left, I asked Billy to tell me, and the dear people who was sponsoring it, they underwrote it and was very, very fine, but that wasn't the promise. I promised God what I'd do. And when a dear brother taking me home that night out to the little cabin where I was staying, uh, I went out up on the mountain to myself about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we had to leave around 4.30. And I prayed, and the moon shining down bright, I could just see it, it was last fall. And I said, Heavenly Father, now I, I leave the field. I go home. And whatever you want me to do from henceforth, you just reveal to me. And so I couldn't tell Billy and them. I didn't want to tell them. didn't want to tell my wife. But all, I said, I'll tell them when they get to Arizona. Well, and I said, I'll wait till they get to the grand old state of Texas, where my mother come from. I said, I'll tell them there. And then I got there. I told them as they come in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Well, Billy, he said, Daddy, better be careful what you're doing. He said, don't the Bible say, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel? I said, I never said about preaching the gospel. I mean the evangelistic service. And I said, look, Billy, I said, God's got man on the field everywhere. He don't need me out there. I can go back and get my job again and, and go to pastor and pastor the tabernacle or something. I may go down and rent the old theater down there and have a Sunday afternoon international gathering and a broadcast or something. I said, I can't stop all at once now because uh, my expenses run about $100 a day at home. So I, I can't with my office and things. I said, I just can't shut right down because I can't do it. And so um, my wife said, Billy, I hope you know what you're talking about. I said, well, I, I know one thing. When I come here one time in a convention, for a convention, and you know the story, because I promised this dear little Swede friend of mine here, Brother Bose, that I would come and preach two days for him in the Philadelphia church after that convention's over, and I was told if I didn't, if I did do that, I couldn't be a speaker. I could take my choice. I said, I'll stay with my word. And I went to Brother Joseph, exactly, because I'd do it again. A man that won't keep his word isn't very good. That's the way I take God. He gives the word, and I believe every word of it. And if he wouldn't keep it, it wouldn't be God to me. I, he has to keep his word. I believe, and he will do it, and I know he will. Now, then I, that night I went to bed when we got home. Uh, my wife was crying. She said, Billy, I'm afraid you're making a mistake. said, you know I want you to be home with the kiddies and I. But said, Bill, look what it's done. It's started a worldwide revival, and I can't see where God will bring it off the field. And I said, well, I promised him. He said, but, but, but he never told you. I said, but I promised him. See? See? That's it. I promised him I'm going to keep my word to him. If I'll keep it to my brethren, I surely would keep it to my Savior. So I went in and slept very well through the night. The next morning, about 6 o'clock, we woke up, and, and I was just getting out of the bed. She was on the other side. I was just rubbing my face like this. I said, well, I'm going to call the public service company today and ask if I can have my old job back again. And I said, if they don't give me my job, Mr. Woods is a contractor, I'll just i go with him, and he and I will go out and wreck some buildings or something. And I've got to work because I've got to go to work. And so uh, uh, this money's got to be met, and I'm $15,000 in debt. And I said, then what can I do? I've got to pay that back no matter how much they underwrote it. I, I'm going to pay it back. That's right. And uh, so uh, she said, you're going to call Mr. Mr. Barr this morning? I said, yep. 
and I'm going to call him and ask him if I can have him a job back, and if he, if that job, someone's got it now, and they can't give him a better job, I said, then I'll just, I'll go with Brother Woods, and we'll go to uh, building buildings or something. Another, I'll help him. And so um, I said, if I come off the field, of course, that's going to bring him off, too, and he can go back to contracting, and we can go to work. So then, as she said, well, I, I sure hope you know what you're speaking of, Bill. And I said, well, I, and I looked, coming, moving down from the ceiling. Oh, I just, maybe, I couldn't expect you to understand it. But that's something that, when we meet in the fr- face to face with Jesus, you right. may feel no way. Here comes something moving. I seen two little dark faced children come moving down, pull a little wagon. I said, Sweetheart, look coming here. I said, I'm gone, man. And she said, What you talking about? I could hear, but I couldn't answer. And these little children was walking towards me, little kind of long hair and black, dark eyes, brown face, coming walking to me. And I I seen then I started moving on beyond the children. I seen Mr. Argenbright, my brother, has gone overseas with me many times, seeing him standing there looking at me. I moved on to him. Now I could still hear my wife walking around in the room. I'll say it this way so that you'll understand it. It might not be the right words, but so you'll understand. That one dimension I was in, I had moved out then into another. I couldn't hear her walking no more. It was gone. And I seen Mr. Argon right, and he was this peculiar little way where he holds his head and kind of smiles as he looks at me. And he said, Brother Branham, he said, we put out cards everywhere, and we got a way for you to get in and out, and everything's ready. I said, All right, Brother Argon right, which way shall I go? He said, Just keep on. I walked on, and I passed some ministers. Then I walked a little farther, and I came into a great panoramic uh, uh, affair, and all kinds of looked like seating for thousands of people. And just then, I heard someone say, "The meeting's dismissed." Well, I said, "Who dismissed it? How did it come to be dismissed?" And I was discussing. I said, "Why is it dismissed? What's happened?" And it was sprinkling rain. And something said to me, by this you'll know. And then I said, well, I don't. And then I went in farther into the vision. And when it did, I was standing with a, you know, a little baby shoe of about a year old, you know, the little bitty aisle. It's not a booty, but a, a shoe. And um, I had a, a string in my hand trying to lace this little eighth of an inch hole in this eyelet with about a half-inch string, just working fervently, trying to push that string through that half-inch string to an eighth of an inch eyelet. And I was breaking the threads all over the string, trying to push it through like that, and it just wouldn't do it, and the string was being all broke up on the end. So just then I heard someone say behind me, Don't you understand that you can't teach babies supernatural things? And I looked around, and it was behind me, and I recognized that boy. He said, you're using the wrong end of the string. And I looked down at the end of the string laying on the floor, a great pile of string, and it was laced down to a nice eighth of an inch so it would go through the hole. I said, I understand. And as I reached to pick up the string, I was taken again. Now, you mark this down. Watch it come to pass. And as I, I started to reach down, I was gone again. Then when I come to, I was standing by the side of a beautiful lake, something like your lake out here in the summertime when it's real pretty and green. And there were fishermen all around the lake, and they were fishing, but they were catching small fishes. And I looked out into the lake, and those great, beautiful rainbow trout out there, and I said, I know this is a vision, but I can't understand those trout. But I said, you know, I believe right down in my heart I can catch those. 
So I picked up the string, but instead of it being a string, it was a fishing pole. And just then the one behind me said, Now I'll teach you to fish out to catch those. And so he took and he said, Tie on the lure, and I snapped the lure on. He said, Now I'll throw way out. Now listen close. Way out into the deep. And he said, When you do, now let the lure sink down first. And then he said, Pull it slow. Now that's really fishman's technique. So I, I said, Then when you do, now you'll feel some nibbles at it, but don't tell nobody what you're doing. Keep it to yourself. And said, so Then when you when you feel it nibble again, said pull it just a little a little bit, but not too hard. He said, and then it'll pull it away from the little fish, and when they scatter, that'll attract the attention of the big fish, and they'll grab it. And said, that's the way you'll catch it. So then when he bites on the third time, set your hook for the, the catch. Now I said, I understand. He said, but keep still. Don't tell nobody. Keep still. And I said, yeah, all right. And I had the lure in my hand, and all these fishermen turned out to be ministers. And they all come around saying, Brother Branham, I know you can catch fish. Oh, of course, that made me feel real good. I said, Oh, yes, I'm a fishman. <laughs> I can catch fish. And he said, I said, Now, here's the way you do it. And I said, You throw it way out. And I went way out into the, to the deep water. And I said, Now, those little fish are fine, brethren, but we want the big ones, too. And I, was, I said, well, See, when it sinks down, now, see, there it is, just about where it should be. Now, see, there's, see there, there are them little fish. I said, now, when he steps again, and I give it a great big jerk, and when I did, I pulled a whole lure out of the water. And when I did, I caught a fish. But I wonder how he ever got the lure in his mouth, because it looked like the skin that stretched over the lure, about the same size of the lure. And I thought, oh, my. And just then, this one who had been talking behind me stepped around in front of me. It was him, the angel of the Lord. He had his hands folded. He looked at me and said, Just what I told you not to do. And I said, Yes, that's right. He said, You see, that first pull was when you used to put your hands on the people and tell them what was their trouble. He said, The second pull was when you'd know the secrets of the heart like I told you. And said, instead of you keeping that to yourself, you tried to explain all about it and tell people. And when you did, said, you didn't know nothing about it yourself. And how could you explain it? And you caused a big bunch of carnal impersonations to rise up, and you see what you've done. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. And I, I said, oh, I, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I don't know what to do. And I was pulling the line like this, and I was uh, trying to straighten my line out, and he looked at me and said, Now, don't get your line tangled up in these kind of times. And I thought, Maybe he's going to give me another trial. And I, was, I said, I'll sure be careful, and was winding my line in, seeing it uh, taken up all right. And then when he said that, just then I felt myself go higher, way up. And when I was set down, then I was beneath and standing up above a great tent. i never seen such a tent. And I just made an altar call, seeming like, down at the altar. And when I was down there, I looked, and there was hundreds of people standing around the altar weeping because they had accepted the Lord Jesus. And they were just weeping out loud. And I said, oh, that's more like it, like that. And a real kind gentleman walked out to the platform, said, while Brother Branham's arresting just a few moments, he said, we'll call the prayer line. And said, everyone with prayer cards, beginning with a certain number, stand over on to the right. Well, I noticed the prayer line seemed like it went all around the tent and out and down the street. Such a prayer line. And I looked over, which was then to my left, and that would be to my right, if I was standing on the platform, it would be that way. There's a piece of canvas stretched there, 
And then behind this canvas was a little square building about 12 foot across and 20 foot long, something like that. Well, I stood and looked at that, and I see him bringing a lady up on a stretcher. And there was a lady there taking her name and things with a, on, a, on a paper. And so there's a, a, someone come and got her and pushed her through, and the next man come through was with crutches. And I see him go through that little building, and on the outside, the lady come out screaming to the top of her voice, pushing this stretcher. And, the, and then there was another lady on the other side, looked like kind of a dark-haired woman, and she said, what happened? She said, I just don't know. She said, I couldn't tell you what happened. She said, I've been paralyzed for 20 years. And look here, I, I feel like I, I, I never was sick. And just then, out come the man, leaping and jumping with his, with his crutches in his hand. And I, I looked at that, and just then I hear something, notice close. There's a difference between the angel of the Lord and that light. Because I heard something moving as it does when it comes here to the platform at night, kind of like a and like a fire whipping around, licking, blaze. And it left me, and it went right down over the top of that audience and went and stood over the top of that little building, and then settled down on top of it. And then when it did, this one that was standing by me, behind me, the same voice, the angel's voice, he said, I'll meet you in there. And this is the third pool, but nobody will know nothing about it. And I said, well, I don't understand why in there. Why that? He said, it will not be a public show this time. And I said, I don't understand going into that closet like that. And he said, is not it written by our Lord? When thou prayest, be not like the hypocrites who like to be heard before man, but enter into the secret closet and pray to the Father who seeth in secret, and he who seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. It's perfectly to the Scripture every time it is. And I said, I understand. Then he took me to this place and set me down in this room. Where was that? And then he told me what to do for the third time. Now, Christian friends, that'll, when I leave this world, that will still be in my bosom. When I, But you mark my word what's going to take place. When that, that was five months ago, six months now, and we had no idea we'd ever go to, to down here at um, Mexico. But I thought I was going to Phoenix. And our dear friend, uh, brother who's praying for the sick, Mr. Allen, he went in there and he said, no, I'm going to stay here. So I'm not going to leave for that part of the month. Well, I wouldn't go in then with my brother in there. I just wouldn't do that. So I don't know Brother Allen, but yet he's doing uh, out there in the work of the Lord. So I, um, they said, no, he was going to stay. I said, well, the brethren called me, the, the association there, the ministerial group, which I was supposed to take a Brother Robert's place while he was gone to Australia. I said, well, that's all right if they've got someone there, Brother Allen, praying for the sick. I wouldn't go. That wouldn't be brotherly. So I said, all right. And Brother Argenbright called me a few days later and said, Brother Branham, I've talked to the Brother Moore. Why not go down in Mexico? I said, oh, Baron Blom, Bomberg, and a lot of them tried to take me to Mexico. I don't care about going down. I said, let's just have an American meeting somewhere. And I said, I wanted to set that tent there for the first time. And he said, well, why not go into Mexico? I said, well, all right, uh, you see about it. So there was another man down there, and he called back, said the meeting's all set for them same dates and said, we've got it on the inside of a great big auditorium down there. And that night I was down to Mr. Woods' and I thought, you know, that's right. Little dark-faced children look like Indians. That's what the vision is. And then I said, but the strange thing, it was supposed to be in a panoramic and something about the dismissing. So then when we 
Two days later, Mr. Argerbach called up and said, Brother Branham, we've got the big bull ring, and the Mexican government is bringing you in for the first time in the history of Mexico that a non-Catholic was ever brought in by the government. So I said, that's wonderful. So I said, now something fixed to happen. But I said, we got trouble coming. And you know, when we went down in Mexico and got ready and went out to the bull ring, somebody, it rained on the road going out there, and somebody had dismissed those meetings, and they don't know who done it yet. That's right. That's exactly right. Then I come back home, flew back the second day. We couldn't even, Brother Moore said, Brother Branham, I'll, I'll find out. And we couldn't even get a minister on nowhere. And nobody knew nothing about it. And Brother Moore said, if I, Brother Branham, as much as I followed you, if I'd have never believed you till this time, I sure would now. <laughs> and I said, that's right. So we come back up. And then I heard Mr. Argenbright was on his road up to see me. I went out to pray at my cave and asked the Lord, what well, he showed me another vision. He said, dead fish as he was laying, and he told me what it was. He said, go back, but well, this is really not the time, but I'll bless it. I went back down there, and somewhere around 40,000, 50,000 people have come to Christ. The dead baby was raised from the dead, and great things taking place. Now, I'm waiting for the hour, you can imagine. How minor this seems to be now, that these things are taking place, these great things that has already took place. The other night, uh, not knowing how many was at the Philadelphia church when they heard me say at a certain person, cursed be the person that raises their eyes while I'm praying for this blind woman. That's what I was doing. <laughs> The Lord is fixing to visit his people in a great marvel something, friend. And I couldn't. It has to be a secret in my own heart. But if you know me and you believe me and love me and respect me as God's servant, just remember I'm telling you a blessing's on the road. That's right. A coming. And it will not be weakening. It will never weaken me no more. And it'll be far beyond anything that's ever happened to her or any time else. It's just something the Lord has given. And I want that would make me a, a believer in grace after I had done and the things that I had done and the way that I had acted and condemned before God. And yet when God speaks anything and makes a, he's going to do it anyhow. Amen. Amen. Moses killed a man one time. But God was determined. He kept him back there on the back side of the desert for 40 years, but he took Israel to the promised land. Isn't he wonderful? He's the same God today that he was then. And friends, I'll say this to you, every one of you Christian believers, regardless of what church you go to. Down in the studios the other day, there was a man I was speaking to him, a very fine man and his wife where uh, Brother Bose and I were making some re recordings for a broadcast. And uh, he was shaking my hand and talking, and I said, uh, his, he loved Brother Joseph so much, and I said, are, are you, you go to his church? He said, no, I'm a Methodist. I said, well, you can be forgiven for that. And so I just kidding him like that. And I said, I was just going on to you. I said, look, Brother. I used to do a bit of riding, and my father was a rider. And I said, up on the Repertoire Forest where we graze the cattle, I said, they, there's nothing that can come on that range but a thoroughbred Hereford. Uh, absolutely, the ranger stands at the drift fence and won't let nothing pass unless it's a registered thoroughbred Hereford. And I said, some of them comes in there with the Lazy J, some comes with a Bar W, some with the Circle R, some with a Tripod. They're branded different brands, but they're all thoroughbred Herefords. <laughs> That's the way it is. We may be Methodist, Baptist, this or that or the other, but as long as you're a thoroughbred Christian by the power of the Holy Ghost, that's the only thing that can come into the pastor, into the fold, because by one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body, 
and we become one people, one church, with one idea and one motive to glorify Jesus Christ while we're here on earth. One heaven. Is that right? right. And we are so thankful for that. Now, I'm past my time of speaking with you, because you've got to hurry back just in a little bit. But how many loves a heart-to-heart -heart talk? You see that right. you, you understand it. We could talk hours after hours. And now, if to say, Brother Branham, could you explain this to me? I can't. I wish I could. But I can't. It's impossible. You can't explain supernatural things. And when you try to do it, it's just as he told me, you cause carnal comparison to rise. See, you do it. It's just actual. It'll do that. And it's, it's a hindrance to the body of Christ. You know what I mean? It's a, it, it causes conflict. Now the thing to do is to be true in your heart, love the Lord with all your heart, and just be thankful that God is marching on with us, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And I say this and make this predicting. I'm not saying it in the name of the Lord now. I'm saying it as your brother. I predict this, and listen close. I predict that America this year, the United States this year, will either receive Christ or she'll start falling from this year. Yeah. This is America's time to repent. And if it doesn't, I predicted that on, I think, about January the 15th or 16th of this year. Just feeling led to say it, and it, I stuck with it, and I look at the wheels turning up. I noticed the great famous evangelist, Billy Graham, he come back from overseas, and he staged his meetings, New York and these great places, to hit the very nerve center and so forth. And I see that Brother Robert uh, excommunicated out of the foreign countries. Mr. Oregon Bright wants me after June and them to go into Germany, back down into South Africa and through there, but something's holding me to America, and all the others seems to be the same way, and I believe that America is going to get her last call this year. Right. I'd be daring and look here at the tapes down here. They might be played 20 years from today. See, you have to watch what you're talking about. Watch what you're saying. But I believe that. Now, the Lord hasn't told me that, but I believe that, that America is either going to receive Christ or is going to turn him down flatly this year. And I predict that they will turn him down. I do. Look what they're doing down in Florida with Jack Cole. Look what they're doing all the way. How could they ever? That's even unconstitutional to oust the man out of a state. We've got freedom of speech. Certainly we have. But the first thing you know, they'll try to stop all of this. They'll try to quit uh, praying for the sick and put a band on it. And just remember that when persecution rises, the church comes to its very height then. It's always the best. Yes, sir. And God's working it all together. Praise be to God, who gives us the victory.
question for the interpretation now and see what he would say to us. to follow this. Now, everybody real reverent when the ladies spoke. Everybody, well, listen real close. Let them who know now. If they... Savior, hearing the message, knowing that we're at the end time, these revival fires on every hill, God promised in the last days that he'd raise up these things to prove that he was God and in our midst and doing that which was right and showing great signs and wonders among the people that the blind would see, the deaf would hear, and there would be great supernatural ministries going on. And today, Lord, we live to see it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that every one of these poor dear children that raised up their hands just now, that they wanted to receive you as personal Savior, that you will save them from sin. Grant it, Lord. And I pray also that while we are in this great move just now, that the Holy Ghost will fill every heart anew, Kindle new fire, Lord, in their souls. May they go out with a zeal after hearing as soon as that word was spoke that our beloved nation would turn down the offer. Oh, God, great kingdom has to fall. Every mortal thing has to give away to immortality. Oh, God, as we see this, we stand yonder on the ancient ruins of Rome. See where that great great monarch country one day stood as the blooming place of the world, the brightest spot in all the world. And today you dig 20 feet under the ground to find the ruins of the great empire. Yonder in where the temple once stood, the Muslim of Omer stands. Many of the great kings, the great nations, the great Alexander the Great, and Greece and many other places, how the kingdoms have fallen. God, we see the foundation of our nation crumbling because of the rejection of the gospel. While great man has swept this nation, combed through every place, the gospel messages went forth, 
a spirit like John the Baptist, not doing miracles or saying anything about miracles, but swept the nation over. Then the miracle-working power of Jesus followed it as it did John. And still our nation, whiskey, tobacco, nightclubs, sin heaping on every side, our great civilization is falling, falling. Everything must give away. All these kingdoms must fall that the kingdom of God might be issued in in its brightness and the great millennium come into place. See an old tree where once a few years ago as a boy set while its great kingly branches, how I thought that tree would be there for hundreds of years and today it's a snag, knowing that all mortal things must give away. I too, Lord, at once this young man, seeing myself give away now, reaching across the top of the line under to see the setting of the sun, today many gray heads is bowed in this building, where once were strong, handsome young man, many women with their faces bowed, wrinkles, and now the tears cutting down the pathway of the wrinkle in their face, which was once lovely and beautiful as young women. Oh, God, all flesh is like grass, sins closed. Oh, Christ of God, receive these poor people into your kingdom. Someday I must stand yonder at the, at the throne of God and give an account for my ministry, give an account for these things that you've permitted me to do, Lord, in the midst of the people to declare the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. God, I must answer for that. Oh, God, burn zeal down into my heart more and more in wisdom that I might know how to lead the people to the Lord Jesus. And today, Father, thou hast promised in thy holy word, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall never come into condemnation, but pass from death unto life. Many hands across your went up, Lord. Many poor, lost people, many of them backslidden and out of the way. God grant that just this minute that the Holy Spirit give him witness that these things are true, that we're at the end time, and they realize that someday they got to pass. May they receive Christ just now while we have our heads out. Is there someone in here now that never raised their hand at the first calling? Would you raise your hand now and say, I want to receive Christ at this time as my Savior? Would you do it? Someone else that never? Did you notice how the fire struck the building when that word went forth? I believe, friend. God bless you, my young friend. Young man with your hand up. God bless Grant, my brother, you have eternal life by believing on the Lord Jesus. I wonder in the balcony somewhere, if we see that God promised these things, we are here to see them come to pass. We know that God promised it, and anything that God promises, God's obligated to do it. Would there be a God bless you, lady, I see your hand. Would someone else raise your hand? God bless you, lady, I see your hand. God bless you, young lady, I see your hand. Someone else. God bless you, lady. I see your hand. Someone in the balcony. I'd like to see someone up in the balcony that's not a Christian would like to say, God bless you. I just knew you were up there, son, with somebody because the Holy Spirit seemed to be leading me to the balcony. I don't know why. I'm not a fanatic. If I am, I don't mean to be, but it just seemed like there was someone in the balcony. God bless you, son. May you, and if that's your wife, I, uh, may you serve the Lord Jesus with all your heart. May it change your life, your home. It will. May you become his servant. Is there someone else just before closing now, or turn to service to Brother Bose? The boys will have to come in a few minutes and start giving prayer cards. Would you just one more raise your hand somewhere in the building, Brother Joseph? If you'll just raise your hand just a moment, I want to pray with you again. Yes, God bless you. I see you down there. Thank you, kind sir. God bless you over there, young man. That's very fine. Now, this may seem a little strange to some of you, 
how that one word would break something like that and a fire would scatter. See, it's because it's truth and the, the keynote to the message, you see, that we're at the end time. God bless you, sir. I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. Now, I tell you, friends, there's many sitting here, I believe, that will stand a horrible persecution for their faith before it's sealed away. God bless you. Someone else raise your hand. God bless you. Way back in the back. I see your hand, sir. Someone else? Now, if someone else raise your hand right quick while we're waiting for the dismissing prayer. If you raise your hand. God bless you, son. God bless you, son. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hand over the man. Yes, God bless you, brother. I see that's wonderful. Just accepting Christ. You, when you raise your hand, God writes it down in the book of life. The very minute you believe you pass from death to life, when you raise your hand, how did you raise your hand? No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. That's it. God, you're drawing. You're raising your hand. Angels writing your name on the book of life. That settles it. Now you'll receive the Holy Spirit if you'll just only believe. Now, with our heads bowed again, our Heavenly Father, send your blessings and I thank you, Father, for this great host of people just receiving Christ. Now, thank you for vindicating back your message, Lord, and giving it, and to do the things that you have done for us today. These people will be happy all the days of their life. Thou hast given them everlasting life just now because they have believed on the Lord Jesus. And Father, when that altar call is made just in a moment to come up here and personally stand around the altar or in the aisle and pray to you and give thanks for their salvation, I pray that every hand that went up will stand in the aisle somewhere and pray to you and give thanks for receiving them, in, uh, receiving them into your kingdom. Grant it, Lord. May your eternal blessings rest upon them. And with our heads bowed, Brother Joseph will continue on the prayer.